Big Sky Howdy, and welcome back to another episode of World Bigfoot Radio. We are once again fortunate to have the amazing host of Spaced Out Radio, Dave Scott, here with us to give us a little part two. He didn't have enough time last time to fill us in on all the cool stuff that he's experienced over there or knows that's gone on in his area. And keeping in mind, he's up in British Columbia, which is, yeah, there's plenty of Bigfoot up there and probably other weird things. So uh, this is a great chance to pick his brain. You know, this guy hears a lot of stories in addition to the stuff he's seen. So once again, welcome back to the show, Dave Scott. I'm surprised you called and said, hey, I want to do this again so soon, man, because I had a lot of fun with you last time, uh, Duke. And uh, to be able to hang out with you again, I, I absolutely am thrilled. Thank you so much for asking me again. You're very, very welcome. Everybody really enjoyed the last show that we did. and. I know a bunch of them told me that, hey, I really like this guy. I'm going to go sub his channel. And a few others on there go, yeah, I subbed his channel when you were on there, Duke. I've been watching it all the time. This guy's really good. So you got good feedback, buddy. That's one of the reasons I had you back right away. Thank you. I appreciate you. Let's talk some Bigfoot, man. Right on, man. Well, let's um, let's go back to kind of where we left off because um, I, I sort of drug you away from the topic. You were talking about how you saw the couple Bigfoot peeking at you there at your um, guru's um, bizarre area and some of the other stuff that had happened there and then we went to your habituation area and we kind of never really got back to your guru's area and other stuff that may have uh, happened when you're up there so if you want to wrap up that to start with let's go there well the fact that there was a lot of real strange activity and this was a place where I saw extraterrestrials in the forest. I saw a UFO landing. You know, you'd see fairies. You'd see shadow people. You'd see absolutely everything. Like I said uh, previous, it was like a mini e SETI ranch at that place. And, you know, I wish uh, that I could still go back on that property. It's been sold to other people. And apparently they're very much into the woo as well, but I don't know them. And it's four and a half hours away. Oh God! <laughs> and so now you got to try and create new areas in a new spot, which is where we are going. But you know, the one thing about being in British Columbia is you hear a lot of stories from everywhere. Whether it's Albert Osman back in the 1920s, where he was kidnapped by Sasquatch, to what we hear today from legends such as the late Dr. John Bindernagel, to hear what people like Thomas Steenberg are doing, or Thomas Seawood, or many others in this field that are really pushing the research. But, you know, the one thing that I notice about being in British Columbia is there really isn't a lot of big names anymore. Like when you saw Bigfoot or Sasquatch back in the 60s, 70s, and 80s, and even into the 90s, man, Duke, there were some big names back then. You know, you wow. think John Green and, and people like that. I mean... Just Renee everybody, to Renee to Hinden. Yeah. I mean, if you weren't from BC, Washington, Oregon, or California, you knew nothing about Sasquatch. <laughs> nothing. You know, so my own situation is this we only had at that farm those two incidents. And there were more where the splashing was in the in the two different ponds at two different times, but that was all we had. We never knew back then at this property when or where things were going to happen. You know, I mean, 
man, you could think that nothing is going to happen. There has the energy is all wrong there, and next thing you know, there's orbs flying around. Like I'm talking orbs like this big, okay. flying around. I mean, it yeah. was <clears throat> in, incredible, an incredible piece that I wish could still continue, but sometimes you got to move on, right? Yeah. <laughs> Find a new, better research area where even more bizarre things are happening. Exactly. But, you know, with areas like that, I always. Um, at this point, especially, I lean heavily toward there's an active portal there, and that's why all this stuff is coming and going in the same location all the time. And I know people with other properties that are similar. I know three of them in Florida. And one of them, uh, I connected uh, one of the people up with the other one, and they went over to their house, um, which is actually being monitored by the government, too, because it's so active. And they're uh, not even allowed to go in the woods at night, unless they have somebody armed with, like, automatic weapons with them, not allowed to go in the woods. But they can go down near the wood line before dark where they like to sit and take pictures of amazing orb pictures. Oh, my God. And these are like, you know, full color, beautiful, nice, clear focus. And you're looking at that going, well, there's five in that picture. <laughs> well, you know, speaking of Sasquatch, about an hour, hour ten south of me in this really small town called Barrier, there is allegedly a lot of Sasquatch activity in that area. And there's one person I work with in my daytime job where he used to be a logger in the area and he actually knows someone in that town. And this man has apparently been so freaked out by what comes out of the forest around his property that he has actually fenced off his property and does not allow anybody to cross that fence line. He is wow. so scared about what is going on. That is one of the stories, you know, as the snow, uh, the snow melts up here that I'm going to be looking into hopefully this year. I want to talk to the guy. I want to say to him, look, dude, I'm a monster hunter. You know, I, yeah. I, I'm coming after this and I'm not scared of it. I, you know, um, if it, hey, if it rips my arm off and I die, that's a good death. You know what I'm saying? As long as you got a GoPro on. <laughs> exactly, exactly. But that's one of the areas where I want to hit. You know, living in central British Columbia, where I do, there is a lot of sightings. But up here, people keep it very, very quiet. The reason being is there's a lot of logging up here. Right. The communities around here rely heavily on logging. They rely heavily on mining and fisheries and Duke, you know, as we've said on Spaced Out Radio numerous times about this creature, I don't know if we're ever going to see it brought to the limelight that it exists. There may come a day. Let's let's not be naive here. There may, may come a day. But what we have to realize is when a new creature or a new species of animal, whatever you want to call it, or an endangered species of animal is found in North America, those areas for hundreds of square miles are immediately shut down to everything. Everything. And I was talking to a member of the Canadian uh, Parliament in Ottawa, which would be the exact same as like, like a senator for you guys down there, a congressperson for you guys. And... I was talking to this person about Sasquatch and he was asking me about it. And he basically told me that if Sasquatch were found, that entire zone is going to be shut down probably for years. Years. <laughs> I get bad news from them. They're going to have to shut down the whole damn country because they're everywhere. <laughs> well, you know that and I know that. But here's the thing. Up here in British Columbia, where I am, where you have people who are staking their careers, especially loggers, who are staking their careers on the lumber industry, where they are literally going out into the forest and cordoning off an area, and that area that they are allowed to log, for, maybe it takes three weeks, maybe it takes a month, maybe it takes all year to log, that's millions of dollars. Each logger up here, I mean, never mind the truckers that are getting paid about 100 Forty hundred fifty thousand dollars a year to haul logs out of the forest. And that's why they're pushing so hard because they get paid by the load. Each logger up here probably makes anywhere between 
70 and a hundred thousand dollars a year. That means their bosses are making millions off of the quota of logs that they're selling. Now imagine all of a sudden we find Sasquatch and they report it as they have to do with any other endangered species or weird animal, okay? What happens is that area gets cordoned off. It gets shut down. No mining, no, no uh, camping, no fishing in the area. They cut that area right off because what they have to do is they immediately send in the scientists and the biologist to try and find, okay, where's its habitat? What's its route? Is it migratory? What's it feeding on? Can we find more? And you can't do that with logging areas. The last story that I recall where there's a lake up here called Hood Lake. And there was a logging crew on the north uh, northeast side of the lake. This was in the summer of 2018. And I've talked to two crew members on that, on that working site. And... When they started logging that area, they started noticing footprints. And then all of a sudden, as the logging started, they started noticing when they went in in the morning, you, you know, you get to the logging site four or five o'clock in the morning and you go until sundown. And they were actually coming back in the morning and their big tractors and, and equipment would have giant dents in them with three, four, five hundred pound boulders sitting at the base of the equipment. Yep. Something picked that up, threw it into the machine, and they said there would be footprints everywhere. They were hearing growls. I never heard that they saw, any of the crew saw anything, but they were hearing noises in the in the bush outside of the chainsaws. And half the crew actually got scared out of there and refused to go back. And the other half kept logging, but nothing was ever brought to forestry or anything like that. And it's funny, my neighbor right across the street from me, his name is Tony. He's a he's an, uh, a natural resources officer. So basically, he's like a he's like a logging cop, okay. And he even tells me point blank, he's like, we never get reports of Sasquatch, never from the logging crews. Yet we know it's happening. We know some of the crews go down to skeleton crews because some people get too afraid to go in there. Uh, you know, so you're really battling nature versus the profit. And that's yeah. what it comes down to. And one of those is always going to win. And right now it's the profit because the companies need those logs. Mm -hmm. And this is why I think, Duke, that we also see or hear of a lot of Sasquatch reports coming out of areas that are freshly logged because the one thing that fresh logging does do is it opens up to a lot of berries it opens up to a lot of deer who love the open area because they can see the predators coming in and plan their escape route if a bear came in or a cougar or something along those lines even a sasquatch all right so i think it's all kind of tied together however sasquatch really doesn't like her her trees being torn up. No, totally agree with you. Similar situation here, Western Montana has 52 mountain ranges and 24 million acres of forest. And until the Canadian government started subsidizing the logging industry, we were competitive. So the logging industry sort of went downhill here, but it's still going on. And if you go up into the uh, Northwest corner of Montana, it's basically all timber industry up there. And they all seem to have no problem with admitting Bigfoot's around. The local towns have Bigfoot this and that and signs all over the damn place. And they don't even have like a Bigfoot festival, which is even weirder. You'd think they'd be capitalizing on it. You can drive down Main Street and see, you know, Bigfoot fly with painted cutouts and all these buildings and schools and banks. And you're like, what's up with this? Do they have a Sasquatch festival here? No. What are, what are those things then? Timber apes? Oh, okay. That's the loggers column up there, timber apes. But there's a, more of a willingness to admit they exist in the areas of the state that aren't specifically geared toward logging. There, everybody knows they're real. Most of them have seen one, or my grandpa saw one, or uncle saw one. Or they've all got a story. Around here, it's the same way. I, buy, I have three uh, Bigfoot bumper stickers on my vehicle, and if I pull into a parking lot, usually there's like somebody there that's either got stickers on there, or they followed me into the parking lot, and they want to tell me their story. <laughs> well, you, you know, it, it's funny because 
this is where I really admire your American culture because up here in Canada, outside of very few areas, we rarely embrace the weirdness. Okay, like in British Columbia, there's really one town that embraces the Sasquatch, and that's Harrison Hot Springs. Right. Yeah, all Sasquatch around, whether it's Mission, it. British yeah. Columbia, or Maple Ridge, or you go up the coast to Squamish, or Whistler, or Pemberton, or even up where I live, or near Kelowna, near Okanagan Lake, where it's more desert, but there's still sightings in those areas in the mountains. Nobody at all is embracing the Sasquatch. You know, like I look at my little town here. Here's a prime example, my friend. You know, it's not Sasquatch related, even though we have a lot of Sasquatch happening here. But in 1989, one of Canada's best recorded UFO and alien abductions happened in my town. Wow. Everybody knows about it, but nobody's allowed to talk about it. We're like 31 years later, man. Nobody is allowed to talk about this, and nobody doesn't want to talk about it. They all think, yeah, I heard that story. It's a bunch of crap or whatever. Why not embrace it? I tried talking to a couple of people on, on the city council about it, and I said, look, my area here is extremely haunted because we're right along the Gold Rush Trail. You know, the Gold Rush Trail started in Vegas or in Nevada, and California and made its way right up to Alaska and the Yukon for the gold. Man, All right. Well, walk. <laughs> right behind me, about three quarters of a mile behind me, is where the original gold rush trail is. And I'm telling you right now, that trail right behind me is haunted because I've done a ghost investigation there. All right. So we have that. We have the Sasquatch in the area. We have the UFOs. And yet my town... Okay, somebody walked behind you, and I got all freaked out like it was a shadow person. No, oh, hold on, let me close the door. <laughs> you know, but I got all freaked out in regards to uh, in regards to this whole situation because nobody wants to talk about it, and yet it's a million dollar tourism idea to promote the strangeness of the town, and this is what I don't get. This is what I don't get a lot about BC communities that could make a big, big fortune on doing these tourism type areas. Whether yeah. it's ghost hunts, whether it's UFOs, claim it, who cares? Who cares? If a, you... It seems to be a cultural thing for down here, here in the lower 48 because you see a lot more commonly and a lot of places that have stuff like this are not even like well known unless you live in the local area. There's one little town over in central Wisconsin that celebrates UFO days. Every year they have like three days of parades and celebrations and they have a fake UFO that they stick into the side of the hills up above where supposedly they saw one or something at some point. And so like that's a theme for the town. Every year they do that. A lot of the towns have like rutabaga days or watermelon days or something. But if there's any kind of weird monster or sighting or something, they take advantage of it. You know, they have hodag days or they have the Loveland Frog or, you know, you can name any kind of weird crypt in the lower U.S. The town where the thing is at, they've got a celebration for it. Dewey Lake Monster, you know. Exactly. Exactly. You know, you go to Kelowna, British Columbia, it's all about Ogopogo. You right know, and even, and even the people who don't believe in Ogopogo literally, you know, will celebrate the Ogopogo because they understand the tourism revenue that it has brought to their town. Yeah. You know, whether it's television shows and television crews from all over the world, guess what? All it takes is one television crew to come to your town and broadcast this nationally or internationally, and immediately the people watching become tourists, yeah. and they go to your area. So it's just one of my frustrations with, with my little community here that's hurting for dollars, and they're too stupid to take advantage of something <coughs> so easy. Well, you know, the other thing politics. is, your, your area, British Columbia, my God, it's scenery so spectacular. It doesn't matter if you see a monster or not. It's worth it just going there to see the scenery. Some of these little dinky towns in the U.S. are just like flat as a pancake with some scrub brush sticking up. They're like, oh, yeah, there was a monster here 40 years ago. Five people saw it. And that, that's it. But they still have a festival every year. <laughs> Perfect. Why not? It doesn't I, hurt anybody. That's the thing. No. It doesn't hurt anybody. If anything... It's literally bringing people to the community. 
Yeah. You know, just that backwards thinking up here. Yeah. Backwards well, thinking. Look at uh, Mothman. They've got a statue of Mothman in the town where it happened and everything. You know, it's a big tourist draw every year. Dewey Lake Monster in Michigan. They made a statue of him. It's a big tourist draw, you know. Let's go search around Dewey Lake and see if we can find No, you don't want to find that monster. <laughs> I know what that thing is. You don't want to find that one. Uh, but it's just interesting the way it's so culturally different from country to country. And um, some countries sort of have a nonchalant thing about it. Like if you're in Germany, you'll find lots of things of uh, like old carvings and statues and stuff of something that looks like Bigfoot. It's Der right. Wildermann. They don't really advertise it or anything and talk about, oh, yeah, there was Bigfoot here. But clearly there were. You know? Exactly. Exactly, <laughs> man. And I don't get why it's not done here. I really don't. <laughs> yeah, that always, that always got me. You know, and the other thing is that Canada is so beautiful. The areas that the people live in that are you could potentially be touristy in. Man, take advantage of it. You guys could be right. making all kinds of bank during the summer when dumb Americans are like, I'm bored. Let's go see where there's a lake monster in Canada or something well, like that. You know? I think part of the reason why something like Sasquatch is not put on the tourism map outside of Harrison is because... You know, British Columbia is, especially in the last 20, 30 years, has, is really starting to become very proud of its First Nations heritage. We, yeah. we don't do enough to, to celebrate the indigenous people here uh, that literally have some incredible stories. And some of the stories that I've heard from uh, the local elders around here, I mean, gosh, it, it's amazing. I've heard stories about Dogman alien abductions, little people, you know, the great bear spirit that if you want to pass one part of the mountain, you have to ask permission of the great bear spirit. Otherwise, he will not let you continue along the path. I mean, it's just absolutely incredible, a lot of the stories. But I think a lot of times here in BC, we don't want to take the chance of upsetting the indigenous nations rather than working together and saying, look, this is what we can do if we come together and celebrate the woo a little bit. You know, this is what we can do to help generate more knowledge and more, you know, benefits towards the community and your stories. And I would like to see more of that for a lot of these communities because it would really help out. Because, you know, the further you go in, North, in British Columbia and pretty much anywhere in Canada, there is a real lack of population. There's a lot of small towns out there, Duke, that are just struggling to survive because as economic pressures, and I realize this has nothing to do with Bigfoot, really, but as economic pressures build up, you know, by shutting down the pipelines or shutting down forestry, you know, going to more energy efficient things and, and hard plastics and other types of materials rather than natural resources, a lot of these towns do not have much. Like, Give you an example, my town two years ago had three mills, employed about a thousand people, you know, directly and then indirectly there's jobs around that. We're down to one mill yeah. and that mill is only running at three quarters staff. We've 120 lost miles from here on the uh, um, Blackfoot River, we've got a little town called Millville. I guess you can probably guess what's there. Yeah. And uh, when I moved here 10 years ago, that town was fairly dead. They're starting to ramp up their timber production a bit now, so there's more more jobs available. But you know, a lot of the the lumber towns along the uh, western Montana here were were um, really reduced size wise because there wasn't that much logging going on. And they, when they do let them log here, it's usually they're not letting them clear cut. You have to select cut. Yeah, um, which is way better for the forest. So, yay, go to it. I like that select cutting. You leave lots of big open spaces to see Bigfoot sneaking up on you at a distance. That works out good for me. <laughs> yeah. Well, I'm just I'm just hoping that in the areas where I have my gifting sites, that I am able to. I'm I'm really scared because you know how you tell a logging area at least up here, and I don't know if it's the same down there, but the mar the the guys who go in and mark the territories of where they're allowed to log. They bring a lot of this, you know, that pink, that pink uh, ribbon, right. and they tie it up to the tie trees. Around the trees, yeah. You know, and that's how they kind of mark an area. And one of the areas where we have a gifting site is marked right now. But I don't think they're going to log it because of the, 
crash site in the area, but you never know. You never know. I mean, money dictates. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Well, getting back to the logging stuff, you know, we have weird logging stories coming out of here, too. One that ended up on uh, Sasquatch Chronicles is where a guy was just basically a backpacker, and he was camping in this valley, and he noticed there was, like, logging equipment and stuff setting up over on the other side. And he's like, oh, geez, oh, here we go. I'm going to leave. They're going to start logging. Well, before he could even leave the area, the logging crew came over, or the security uh, came over and asked him if he had seen anything unusual. Like, weird things have been happening for a couple days. And they were seeing this really huge guy. They thought it was a guy. Standing at the edge of the wood line, watching him and stuff. And Well, <clears throat> that very night, uh, he heard all kinds of commotion coming from over where they were at. And uh, apparently in the morning, they came and asked him again if he had seen anything. And he went back over there with them. And uh, the uh, bulldozer that they had has a roll cage on it. And something had picked up a boulder big enough to smash the roll cage down to the seat and placed it on top after smashing the roll cage down to the seat. So Ooh. they couldn't really blame him for it because obviously he didn't do that. But we had a similar thing happen to a logging crew here in the Bitterroot Mountains. They told one of my researchers about it. He ran into this old retired logger who had just quit the year before. Uh, they're standing outside of Walmart and he starts, <laughs> so he says, hey, you got a Bigfoot shirt on. Yep, I sure do. I've seen him before. I got chased off a mountain by him. The guy is like, oh yeah? I've seen a few things too. Oh, what'd you see? So he tells him this story. We had this parcel that we were allowed to log. We moved all of our equipment in there, cut out a basic clearing where he could store everything, made a road in there, and that was, you know, good until the next Monday we were going to come in and start actively logging. Well, when he came back, everything was messed up. The um, chainsaws, which had been actually um, chained to a tree and covered, had uh, the chain had been snapped. The chainsaws had their blades bent around the trees. Um, they had two vehicles that they had left there, um, both of which were mashed down to their frames, sitting on the ground. One of them had the cab and everything destroyed, too. He said it looked like somebody brought in a crane with a wrecking ball and just dropped it on the trucks over and over again. And they took one look at that and went, uh, well, uh, let's move to parcel B. <laughs> and they did not go back there again. Right? I mean, I mean, I've heard some of those stories. Never that violent up here, you know, but the stories that we hear around here involving loggers, probably the funniest story I ever heard was it came out of the Gibsons area on the on the coastline where a former friend of mine, he his brother was working on a gravel road doing something for the hydroelectric area up there, watching the power lines or something. And his brother saw something dark past the window. So... You know, he kind of turns his head to look out the back of the window. Oh, there's nothing there. Turns back to start eating his sandwich. And all of a sudden, this big hand comes in the open window of the driver's seat, grabs the sandwich, and walks back, you know, and starts walking away. <laughs> you know? And now, I don't know how true this is. The person who told me is First Nations. And, and same as his brother who had the sandwich plucked from his hand. But he swears by the story that it happened. So, you know, I have no reason to disbelieve the guy would be pulling the, the wool over my eyes with this one. But, you know, we have to take every account that we can. As, as real as it may seem and as fake and phony as it may seem. And then we have to dilute them to see what is real and what is not. I take a lot of First Nations stories very much verbatim. Now, a lot of people will say... Well, you know, I'm steeped in the woo and and that maybe I'm just uh, a little too gullible because, you know, I don't know the person, but I'm I'm buying their experience. But the one thing that I've learned about interviewing and talk, not really interviewing, but talking to a lot of First Nations people in my community and other communities where I've lived is they really want to talk about this subject if they know you can, they can trust you. And that you're not going to make a mockery of them or laugh at them because that's why a lot of the elders shut down communication about a lot of the stories and legends that came through because the white man just was not paying attention. But when you show a, a real honest integrity and curiosity and interest in a very kind, loving way to the indigenous people, they open up. And yeah. the stories that you get out of there... I remember I, I, I had a good friend of mine 
a client of mine, and him and I became very good friends. And he was telling me that up in the mountains around Chilliwack, British Columbia, where there's a lot of Sasquatch activity in between Chilliwack and Washington State, it, it, believe it or not, it's actually a border community if you go way back in the mountains, about 30, 40 miles. And he was telling me his brother has a cabin. First, uh, First Nations has a cabin way out in the woods. Well, during the summer times, because in, in that cabin, he never needed his door locked, he would go to bed at night. And next thing he knows, he would be woken up in the middle of the night by a family of four to five Sasquatch, and they would carry him out of his bed and sit with him in front of the fire that was burning outside. So before he went to bed, he would build a fire in his fire pit, and then, you know, he had rocks and everything set up around there for seating. And and he would literally go to bed. And then he would get woken up in the middle of the night. Didn't happen often, but it happened often enough where it makes for a good story. Where he would be carried out and he would wake up sitting right by his fireplace. And really? What, what happened here? What happened here? But those stories don't get told because... A lot of First Nations are sick and tired of being berated. Yeah. You see what I'm saying? Oh, and if yeah. we and the one thing that I've tried to stress to my audience is if if we got away from that, you know, that that old tired cliche, oh, that 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 stupid person, you know what I'm saying? And literally just sat down like you and I do, or you do with your show, or that I do with my show, and just sat there and say, just talk to me. Just talk to me. Tell me the stories. It's incredible. I remember talking to to one of the former chiefs here. And I asked him, I said, so how is the Sasquatch around here? Around your First Nation? Do you see a lot? And he goes, well, no. No. He goes, we really don't. And he talked very slowly and thoroughly. And he goes, but I sure wish the star people would leave our people alone for once. It's been going on for centuries and they don't stop bugging us. Now we got aliens. Yeah. Yeah, I remember listening to a bear from the Bigfoot Outlaws talk about that. And I think he was hanging out with the Kiowa and some of their elders and they were talking about Bigfoot and changing, you know, exchanging stories. And they'd tell him a story and it all checked out from what he knew and he'd tell them a story and it all checked out. And then all of a sudden they switched to Thunderbird and he's sitting there going, uh, okay, what do I do with this? Because they're talking about this thing just like it's as real as Bigfoot is. And I know Bigfoot's real. And now they're all telling stories about the Thunderbird. Do I want to stick around and see what else they're going to talk about? You, right. know? But you have to. That's the beauty of it. If we, you know, and this is my biggest complaint about Sasquatch research. If you don't mind me griping here for a Go minute. ahead. It's your time okay. to gripe, Dave. We don't know, Duke, what this creature is. We can only assume. And for many of us researchers out there, I shouldn't really include myself in that because I'm not a researcher. You know, I'm a journalist. But for many of the researchers out there to completely poo-poo the, the stories of the First Nations and the accounts or of where many around North America believe this creature is a shapeshifter or it's interdimensional or it has some sort of supernatural ability. What really hurts this field is where we have people running around the forest saying, I'm looking for a monkey or I'm looking for Gigantopithecus. Really, you couldn't tell the Gigantopithecus if it was standing right in front of you. Mm -hmm. You couldn't tell. Theoretically, if it existed, it'd look like a giant orangutan anyway. Exactly. But what I always like to say about that is if you really think you're looking for a elusive North American ape, you need to consider why there hasn't been one in a zoo for 150 years already. Because we have uh, humans are the best hunters on Earth. Remember, we were out killing the largest animal on Earth, the whale, before we were even using gunpowder technology. We're out in a canoe with a friggin' <laughs> to, you know, now those guys had balls taking them out yeah but my point is you know 
if this thing was just normal flesh and blood, we would have bagged a bunch of them. And chances are good that we actually have bagged a bunch of them, but you know who doesn't want it coming out, so they haul the corpses away. And I hear these kinds of stories all the time, too. Um, so, yeah, there's definitely, from my standpoint, um, they have paranormal abilities. And I'm backed up on that by a lot of other senior researchers, including the, what I consider the most preeminent one on the face of the earth, Dr. Igor Burtsev from the Department of Hominology in Moscow, Russia, who's been out in the field doing this for 60 years. And he says they have weird paranormal abilities. We don't understand yet how they do things, period. He's seen it enough times. And, and I would agree with you on that. And, and I learned firsthand about the pixelation that I saw that we discussed in the previous interview. You know, but for me, what really bugs me about this, this field is we have too many people out there right now, whether it's the BFRO, whether it's independents, who are running around this force trying to convince people that their opinion is right. And what they do is they hide behind the word science. Mm -hmm. The biggest issue that we have in any field in this entire paranormal genre, whether it's ghost hunting, UFOs, aliens, Bigfoot, Dogman, does not matter, is we got a bunch of people who haven't conducted a scientific experiment since they were in high school, hanging out claiming, well, this is a monkey, or this is a great ape, or this is whatever. How do you know? Well, I'm not, I don't believe those supernatural type stories. We're gonna push them over there. I do real research, I'm conducting science. Really, are you conducting it in a controlled environment? Using a drone is not scientific. Mm -hmm. Using uh, plaster casts is not scientific because most people who use plaster casts are not reading the dermal, th uh, the dermal ridge lines on the foot to see if there is any growth in that creature. They're not comparing those dermal ridge lines to other castings in the area that they may or may not have found to see if it's the same creature or something different. They're just casting a footprint because they've casted a footprint. Nothing scientific outside of very few that are conducting it is going on. Most people who are going out in the field, myself included, we just wanna see one, man. We want to capture one on a trail cam or on an iPhone or on a GoPro. That's what we want. We're not conducting anything scientific. So many people in this field have to get their asses off their high horse and open up their minds to realize we don't know what this creature is. We can only assume, but science is not built on opinion. It no. is proving or disproving theory. And if we refuse to investigate one portion, which could be scientific, we're not doing the field or the research any justice whatsoever. Agree. And how much actual science can you do on a creature that lives 100% exclusively in the field when you're sitting in your dank basement all the time looking at your moldering books <laughs> with your dogmatic opinion, which is no less opinionated exactly. than the Vatican? You, know, you, you have opinions, not facts, pseudoscientist. And here's how you can tell a, scient a real scientist from a pseudoscientist. A real scientist is open-minded and looks at all the evidence connected to a phenomena and doesn't just go, nope, I'm going to look at this little box right here. Anything that falls outside of it, I'm not going to look at that. That's not scientific. Mm -hmm. uh, and I agree with you. It's just like everybody goes out there now looking for Bigfoot or Dogman. They've got the army boots on. They've got the camouflage pants, the camouflage T-shirts, the camouflage jackets. Guess what? Sweatpants work. Yeah. Jeans work. Yeah. Cargo pants work. In fact, yeah. you know, when I go out in the field, man, I, I wear a fishing vest because that way I, I can put my car keys in my wallet somewhere. <laughs> you know, I mean, that that's yeah. the reality of it. I mean, we don't need, stop playing the part. Stop trying to impress chicks or, or guys or your, your fellow humans. I'm a Bigfoot hunter. I'm, I'm searching for this monkey. No, you're not. You don't know what the hell you're searching for, okay? And yeah, as long as you're closed-minded, you're not conducting anything scientific. Wearing camo isn't going to foil Bigfoot and his ability to see you, so I don't... Hey, what, I may have to wear a ghillie suit and run through a creek, right? <laughs> I know of one report where somebody was wearing a ghillie suit and actually saw a Bigfoot as a result, and they were sitting underneath a tree with the ghillie suit on. It's like a pine tree, and they're waiting for turkey to come by. And as the sun was coming up, a Bigfoot walked by them.
and they didn't really make any noise or anything but all of a sudden he just stopped and turned and looked at where they were sitting under the tree and his eyes got real big like oh crap there's a human sitting under there and then he just kind of like more quickly walked off the same direction he was going right i so mean usually just... you can't trick them like that i mean they're pretty sly they can smell you they can see you they can hear you uh, but apparently this guy was really good. He might have been half asleep sitting under the tree, not making any noise. But sure enough, and, uh, you know, a few other people have had that. But for the most part, they're so elusive and they're so aware of what's going on around them. Unless they really want you to see them, you're just not going to see one. You know, exactly. I, I, you know, but you hear stories, you know, like British Columbia is also very well known for its its hunting industry. And, you know, like I'll talk to some old hunters who will literally say, you know, I've been hunting these bushes for 50 years. I've never seen anything. 40 years, 25 years, never seen anything. Does it exist? You weren't looking for it. <laughs> okay. Number well, one, that's it's like my buddy Mark. When I, he's now a believer of Bigfoot. But for the previous 35 years before missing me, or missing meeting me, pardon me, he never believed it. He was a tracking guy. He was a... He used to track wolves and cougars on Vancouver Island. He was a hunting guide. He was He's a hunter himself. And he goes, I, when I showed him the footprint of that 15 and a half foot, 15-inch uh, print, pardon me, okay, and he stood down on his one knee and just shook his head and for 20 minutes couldn't say more than, what the hell is this, and I don't believe this, <laughs> you know, because that convinced him. And he goes, how come I've never seen this before? I said, you weren't looking, Mark. You weren't looking. Yeah. Yeah. And that's it. That's, it's well, that simple. Yeah. Actually, Dr. Bindernagel mentioned that, too. It's not so much that uh, seeing is believing. It's believing is seeing. If you believe that they're out there and you actually start looking for the signs and you know what to look for, you can mm -hmm. find the signs of them. But if you have no idea what you're looking for, Good luck, man. <laughs> you know, like, you got to have like, a pretty good grasp of where they're liable to be in the first place. And then you've got to really look through the area and go, okay, any giant structures that are really obvious around here? Let's go around them and look for tracks and stuff, you know. So even if you really know what you're doing, it still isn't that easy to find these guys. And I don't work from eyewitness reports. I'm not an investigator. I, I just know, I look at a topo map and I go, they're liable to be here. Let's go. Mm -hmm. And usually they are. <laughs> you know, and, and then you get the the people in the community, Duke, who really ixnay the idea of putting in gifting sites in certain areas. Oh, don't waste your time. Those are childish. Those are stupid. Uh, you're not going to be able to make any communications. They don't work. What does it hurt? No, it doesn't. And the fact is, sometimes they do work. But I think it mainly depends on the disposition of the human that's got the gifting area out there. Exactly. If you're trying to trick them and get pictures of them with a game camera or something, well, good luck. I only know one person that's actually good at pulling that off. Everybody else gives it a heroic effort and it just don't work. Uh, and I, I strongly suspect they like them and they're just letting him get pictures of them and that's why it's working for him. But I think it has a lot to do with the person that's interacting with them because they're they're very observant and every time you're in there they're going to be watching you they're going to see what your personality is like you know what your what sort of things they'll pattern you how do you do things what order do you do things all this kind of stuff mm -hmm. they're gathering all that information on you and sometimes it takes people you know years and years maybe even a decade yeah. to get to the point where they want to actually do anything to interact with you and it has a lot to do with your disposition and i think it has a lot to do with their curiosity if you can engage them with something that they're actually interested in it'll keep coming back and you know obviously food is interesting but with that situation it's sort of like you're playing the game with the fed bears a dead bear um, and you can be feeding sasquatch that are not at all friendly but they like the idea that you're giving them food and hey why did you show up and not give us food we're pissed that could be bad <laughs> well i haven't brought food to any of mine yet because my big thing is there's a lot of animals in our forest you know yeah. that that could kill you and, yeah. you know, I, or eat it, you know, whether it's grizzly bears, black bears, the three big cats, we got cougars, lynx, and bobcats up here. You know, there's porcupines, there, there's, uh, you know, moose, deer, elk, caribou. You know, we have a little bit of everything up here, you know, in the great white north where I am, where 
there's a lot of animals out there that could could feed off of that. So for us to put food out in our area, it didn't make sense. Yeah. Now, like if I was more in the lower mainland area by Harrison Hot Springs, I would look at it, you know, because I'm not dealing with grizzly bears. I'm not dealing with uh, a lot of a big deer population. I'm not, you know, I'm not dealing with, uh, you know, 1,400 pound moose or, what, or uh, you know, free range cattle running around or wild horses not dealing with it whatsoever. So I could hang a bag of apples up in a tree up high or, you know, a, a, a trout or a salmon up high, you know, out of the reaches of a, of a black bear standing on its hind legs. I could do that down there. Up here, can't do it. Yeah. You know, the only thing that I would pr probably try would be some juice boxes or uh, a jar of peanut butter. That's about it. But until I start getting some firm confirmation that I'm having it, you know, my job right now that I look at, I want to expand my gifting site. I've had, you know, my one gifting site, the stuff has been there for four years. I don't want to move that. But what I do want to do is I want to expand it. I want to bring in new items, whether it is a mirror or or some some other colorful type objects or toys or or whatever it may be. I want to expand that area to try and lure them back in, okay? You know, because I've heard a lot of cool stories about Bigfoot apparently like looking at themselves in a mirror and they will leave, you know, lip prints or fingerprints on the glass because they've never seen themselves before, most of them. So to see themselves and what they look like, they're going to test it out much like apes or monkeys would, we would assume. You know what I'm saying? The curiosity of it all. So that's my goal for this year is to expand on the toy area. If I start getting a little bit more action, I may take it up a notch by putting a jar of peanut butter out there or something along those lines. I don't know. I don't know. But it's all about intention as well. Yeah. I have a friend uh, that's a researcher that left out a peanut butter jar for him and apparently they couldn't figure out how to open it. But he did find the jar later on and the top of it was sort of caved in like somebody had pushed their finger through it and there was a little twig down in the bottom of it that somebody had been using to get the last little bit out of the bottom of the peanut butter jar. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but I mean we can't discount it uh, you know that's the big thing we can't discount it because we don't know what is going on or how it's actually happening we don't yep. know and it gets a little tiring to me when I when I see so much negativity that is happening in this field regarding the entire phenomena. You know, why does it have to be that way? I mean, am I wrong about that? You know, because let's face it, Duke, if I'm going out in the field, the one thing that I have learned a lot about, about um, Bigfoot researchers not so much UFO researchers, but Bigfoot researchers, they're happy to help. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. They're happy to help. And I know, for instance, if I am hanging on out and I'm getting ready to go in the forest, like give you an example, I have never seen Duke, I've never seen a, a tree structure. I've never seen one. I've never seen that those really cool, you know, bent pieces of tree that seem yeah. to make a, a, a mini shelter or just a or just a marking or you get, you know, the trees that are all crossed up. Yeah. See, up here, when I see them, we get a lot of high winds through the forest. So I see fallen trees into trees all the other time. Not once have I seen something where I could say, oh, that's a Sasquatch hut. Yeah. You know, I just well, have never seen that. I want to know how to find those. I want to know that if you see a tree that's been pulled up from the ground, what do I look for on that tree to make sure that it isn't, you know, a a bear or 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 a horse right. or a or a bull walking in the, a free range bull walking in in the forest? How do I know it's not that? Right. You know what I'm saying? There are ways to distinguish it, and it just takes years of practice and experience to be able to recognize. Absolutely, it does. Because I, I walk through areas sometimes, there's like timber all over the place, and I don't even look because it's like, <laughs> this is just natural. Nature caused this. Then you see other things where, here's where the next structure.
structures. If it's an actual Sasquatch X structure, you will find that 99% of the time the diameter of the two trees is identical. A lot of the time all the branches have been ripped off and sometimes the bark has been ripped off too. And some of the best ones we found up here, the trees were moved into place. They weren't pushed over, they were moved in from somewhere else. First one Richard Williams found up there in the Scalcaho Pass was about 50 feet tall, was made of two entire lodgepole pines, which had all branches and, and uh, bark stripped off of them. Both of them had been moved into place. We don't know where from. But uh, that's like definitely not natural. <laughs> so yeah, there's ways to tell. Leaners sometimes, you'll see like, you know, trees. a tree falls over, it falls on another tree. Okay, not a lot of trees have a Y. A tree falls over and lands perfectly on that Y, get suspicious. You see two or three trees that have fallen over and all crossed through that Y, very suspicious. Then start looking at them. Were they here originally? Were they moved in position? Is there symmetry to this? Are they the same sizes? There's this whole checklist you go down. And then you start looking around the base and you usually find tracks too. How's so. it look from below? You hear that folks? Wow. Oh, we're coming to check it out. This one's still on the ground, it's pushed over. Or fell over. And this one is pushed over. Or fell over. Making a magical structure. They just happen to all go right in between the fork of that tree. Yeah. Of all the places they could fall, right into the fork of that tree. Oh, it's totally coincidental, just like that huge teepee we're going to go yeah. check out. Yeah, no. Coincidence happens naturally. <laughs> There's the boulder pile I was standing on top of. There's the X. Right there. <laughs> and there's the other side of it. We've lost part of our team. Team Helena wandered off. So Mike is trying to find them right now. So we're just getting more extra footage of this while we're waiting around for them. Let's see if we can get this from another angle. It's lots of fun wading through the timber. There it is again. You can see the boulder stack in the background. I was standing on the ground around here. The ground is highly uncooperative. Makes people not want to walk through all this stuff. Sounds like Mike coming back disgruntled because he can't find Team Helena with their two dogs that wandered off. We'll be back, guys. We got uh, Hawk for scale here. Underneath the big old X structure. I want a list of what to look for from you because you're the pro and others who, who you and I both know mutually, you guys are the pros. I'm just the amateur who wants to see it once again. I'm not yeah. there to record it. I'm not there to photograph it. I just, you know, I can honestly say I'm the idiot who when I see it again, I'm going to follow it. I'm yeah. going to follow it and I'm going to see, I want that experience to last because 
My last experience didn't last very long. It maybe lasted, you know, with the one it lasted a couple of minutes, but the one that I saw walking where I got the full back and right side profile, I want to see that again. I want to be that close to this creature again or closer. And I know that's being brave and I'm talking tough right now on a microphone, sitting in a very secure, safe studio. Uh, but the way I look at it is I want to I want to have that close encounter again. And that's the only thing I'm looking for. I have nothing to prove personally that this experience or these creatures aren't real because I've seen them with my own eyes. Yeah. Right. And if people don't believe me over it, like I have a couple critics right now, I don't care. I really no. don't care. I know what I saw. I'm never going to bullshit my audience, pardon me, uh, for no for uh, trying to pull the wool over their heads to make myself more uh, attractive to listen to. Because Oh, that Dave guy, he's seen Sasquatch or he's seen aliens or he's seen ghosts. No, because when you BS your way through things, eventually the truth comes out that you're faking. Yeah. And so far, my truth is what I tell my audience. And I want to keep that truth. And that's why I want that encounter. And the only way I'm going to get that encounter is by putting myself in that situation. And hey, worst case scenario, I'm a good death for Sasquatch ripping me apart. And I could go to the afterlife all loud and proud saying, you died in a car accident. You died of jumping off a building. You died this way. Sasquatch people, number one, Sasquatch. Yeah. I didn't die choking on a piece of cheesecake or crushed by a giant mound of industrial strength balsa wood. <laughs> I was ripped apart by Sasquatch. Exactly. That is not a paper doubt. Yeah, no, I totally agree with you. You know, and, and I've been there a number of times, and sometimes when they're around, it's just scary as hell. They don't necessarily have to be doing anything. You just get that creepy vibe. And, uh, you know, the worst... I've had them like four or five times now actually wake me up while I'm sleeping in my tent. The last time this summer, I want to walk by and just booted the air mattress and skidded the air mattress about four inches with me on it. And I woke up and went, knock it off. And then I realized nobody else is walking around camp. What just kicked the air mattress? You know? Right? <laughs> There's only one other person here, and I can hear him snoring in his tent 50 feet away. Then they went over and woke him up. I guess that's why they woke me up first. But uh, yeah, it never it, it never ceases to be creepy, even if you know that the ones in your area are non-aggressive and you, you really don't have anything to worry about. When they're right there, it can still scare the crap out of you earlier in the summer. 100%, man. Yeah, earlier 100%. In the summer, I had uh, and, and you know what? This is what I would love to say to new people coming into this field. Just because someone is on television looking for Bigfoot or hunting Bigfoot or wanting to fart next to Bigfoot, okay, doesn't mean that they are the best. People no. who come up with quirky terms like squatch and yeah. BS like that, nine times out of ten, they're just weekend warriors. But the real civilized people who are in this field are some of the nicest people I have met in the paranormal supernatural world. And, you know, I know... For instance, Duke, you know, we've interviewed, you come into my chat room, I've interviewed you, you've interviewed me now twice. You know, we're, we're acquaintances, and I think we're good acquaintances. But, you know, I already knew just by hearing the reputation of people like you from others in my chat room that if I ever had a Sasquatch question, I could come to you as a relative stranger and say, this is what I would like to do. I would like to start getting into this. I, it, this subject has interested me for years. I want to start. I want to do it right. And you know what? You're the kind of guy, and there's a ton of people like you out there who would sit there and say, you know what? Let's have a chat. I can make time for you on a phone call and because nobody wants to sit there and email all that crap. Yeah. Okay. But I could make time for a phone call and we could have a chat. And I'll tell you the do's and don'ts to proper research and etiquette. And, you know, that's how we grow the field. That's how we bring better researchers into their areas. And maybe, just maybe, because of people like you or Nate Rudd or, or anybody, anybody in this field, Thomas Steenberg, whomever, maybe if we just take that time to listen and keep an open mind, we're going to get a little bit further ahead on finding what this is. So I, I think people like you do a real service yeah, to, to this 
to this field of research, and it's important. Thank you, sir. I really appreciate that. You know, one of my, because I'm in the fortuitous position that I'm at, where I actually have the respect of most of the uh, Sasquatch community, and the really the guys who really know what they're doing and have the evidence to prove it want to be on my show. That means I can become friends with them and network. And this is turning out to be a great thing for the whole overall Bigfoot community because now the field researchers that are up to speed are actually communicating with each other. And when something weird happens, you've got half a dozen other researchers all over the continent. You can call and go, hey, this just happened over here. Have you ever seen anything like that in your area? Bingo, bango, instant answers. No, it's an anomaly. You're weird. Or, yeah, usually you get like five or six of them going, yeah, same damn things happened over here. What the hell is that all about? I don't know, but we should start looking into it because apparently it's a pattern. You know? <laughs> exactly. Exactly the point, man. Exactly the point. And, you know, I w- you know, if I was like an 18, 19, 20-year-old kid watching this, and I'm like, you know what? I want to go see if Bigfoot is real. You know, because when you're 18, 19, 20, you'll go camping in anything. doesn't yeah. matter whether it's snow, whether it's, you know, pouring rain. You- you'll do stupid things when you're that age. And... <laughs> You know, I, sure did. I mean, wouldn't you just love to take, you know, and teach a, a, a class of like 18, 19 year old kids, 20 year old kids and just say, look, it's actually quite simple. This is what you do. Yeah. It's not about finding the creature. It's about being safe. Learn the forest. Learn what can hurt you first before you go into the forest. Are there rattlesnakes there? Are there, are there vipers there? Are there any types of poisonous plants that you need to know about or poison frogs what comes out at night what comes down at day where should you look where should you not look you know what do you do if you break your hand or or you see a bear or or what do you do under these circumstances that's what needs to be taught before we get into bigfoot yeah, that's Big- Woodsman 101, though. People really need to kind of have that background before. It's like, look, you're, you're looking for something that's easily as dangerous as a bear if you tick them off, more so, and uh, very elusive and very smart. So you at least need to be up to speed on what the normal average dangers in the weight environment that you're in are. And you're absolutely right, Dave, because I, I lived and did uh, research down in Florida. In Florida, it's all about be careful what you're stepping on. You got poisonous snakes, you got poisonous spiders, you got gators, bony pigs, usually pretty low slung. They come ramming out of the palmetto and rip you to pieces. Um, you know, there's even a few panthers down there. So it's a completely different environment. Up here, there's no such thing as poisonous snakes and scorpions. And sp- <laughs> Theoretically, I have rattlesnakes. I've never seen one in 10 years here, but I've seen three Bigfoot. Okay. <laughs> well, thankfully, in my area, I don't need to worry about snakes. I'm fine with that. I got no snakes. I got no sharks. I'm happy up here in the middle. You know, I'll take a grizzly bear over a shark or a snake every time. Yeah. Every time. Well, the other thing I like about this situation is that, as I found out in the areas that the uh, Sasquatch really frequent, like if it's an area that they're hanging around, there aren't any predators. Yeah. That one valley we go to for the last five years, we've been up in that camp, you know, at least every month during the summer for five years now. We found one wolf track in that valley the entire time we were up there. And the only bear track we found was on the rim on the outside of the valley, going over the rim away from the valley. (laughs) And he was a big honker, too. But, you know, if they have uh, juveniles, you know, youth, little baby uh, squatches or whatever you want to call them, the little Sasquatch juniors running around there, they don't want big predators wandering around that area. That's a hazard to the kids. And sure, the kids can climb a tree and get away from them, but, you know, they take the same kind of precautions human parents would. So if there's large, dangerous predators around an area, the Sasquatch will be chasing them out. So I feel safe as hell when I'm up there camping. The only thing I got to worry about is the Sasquatch. If they don't like me being there, well, I'm screwed anyway. Yeah, but not here, that, man. I don't have to worry about anything else, you know. <laughs> not here. Not here, man. I'll tell you one, one story, Duke, that I heard. I do a uh, – up until COVID hit, I was – doing a ghost tour at our local museum and um, to help raise money. And over three years of doing the ghost tour, proud to say we raised over $14,000 for the museum. And we donated everything back. It was a beautiful thing. They were always like, come on, let us pay you for this. No, no, no. This is being community oriented. You know, just take the money until they screwed it up. But that's (laughs) a a whole nother story. But 
we would bring in people, you know, we'd get 20, 25 people, sometimes 30 people a tour. So here we are in the middle of summer of 2019, we're doing the tour and, or was it 2018, 2018. And we have this schoolhouse and there's usually not a lot of ghost activity in the schoolhouse, or maybe I just don't have luck there. I don't know. But what we ended up doing, because it was kind of a dead building, pun intended, was we we would take all of our, our, the people on our tour group and we'd sit them in desks. And we'd say, okay, this is a time where we like to talk about our paranormal supernatural. How many of you have seen UFOs? How many of you have seen Sasquatch? And this one guy keeps his hand down and his wife elbows him like this. Come on, tell him this story. Tell him this story. No, I'm not telling the story. He'll probably think I'm nuts. You know, older couple. Yeah. And I'm like, sir, I've been face to face with aliens. I believe you. You know? <laughs> yeah. And he goes, well, I guess when he was 18 years old, back in, oh, the early to mid 70s, him and his buddy were camping somewhere around Whistler. Now, for people who have been from North Vancouver, once you get past Squamish and you start getting into the mountains to head to Whistler, British Columbia, there's a lot of lakes. And then you go past Whistler, you know, which is famous for its skiing, and there's even more lakes and farmland and hidden water areas and rivers. It's beautiful, beautiful territory in the mountains. And so this gentleman and his buddy, they're about 18 years old back then. They decide they're going to go to this lake to do some trout fishing. No. The first night that they are there, he says that, you know, they set up their tent, went and did a little fishing. They got their campfire and they decide they're going to go to bed. So they're in their sleeping bags, sawing logs, said it was about two o'clock in the morning. And all of a sudden it just felt like a forklift where arms went underneath the tent. And that's what woke them up lifted up the entire tent. They heard the pegs go ping, 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 oh, you know, pop it out of the ground. And here these two boys were in the air. And then they started screaming and moving around. What the hell's going on? What's going on? And on those arms, slowly put them back down on the ground, pulled out from underneath the tent. And by now the tent's collapsed. <laughs> by the time they got out of the tent, this thing was gone. So... I'm like, this is awesome, right? Like, this is this is just awesome. So the one boy goes back to that area where they race home, tell their parents what happened, you know, because they're now not staying there. Yeah. Parents want to know why the boys are home early. So the next weekend, the other boy goes back to that area with his dad and his brother. The two boys, the, the two sons, slept in the back camper of the truck while the old man slept with his shotgun oh, in God. the cab of the single cab truck. And so I guess about two o'clock in the morning, all three of them get woken up because the truck, the truck is rocking like there is an earthquake going on. The old man wakes up stumbling, bumbling, you know, scratching his nuts and doing whatever, <laughs> hops out of the cab sees this giant creature rocking the 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 uh, the truck <coughs> excuse me fires off a shot hits it with his shotgun and the creature roars takes off into the forest and they went you know with the flashlights looking for a blood trail couldn't find anything couldn't find anything this thing was gone and they said they would never been back to that area. And that happens to be the area, whether you love them or not, that happens to be the area where Steve Istall lives. Yeah. Yeah, right? Steve gets some interesting reports out of his area. And of course, you know, being where it is, obviously there's Sasquatch all over the place up there. Mm -hmm. And, and they, all. Steve lives about Steve lives about two hours southwest of me. Okay, so you're further into Sasquatch territory. He's down yeah, there in I, the whip, whippy land. <laughs> yeah, I am. I am. Uh, I'm almost at the central part of the province. So the if you were to drive another five, six hours north, you'd be at the central part of BC. 
I'm at the little butthole right below it. <laughs> yeah, there's plenty of wilderness up there. There's no shortage of wilderness and mountains up there where you're living. Mm -hmm. So totally, you know, that's the, that's a terrain they, they like. They tend to favor that. We've even been able to pattern them down to uh, in areas with the lower mountains. They seem to prefer lower montane for their environment, four to 6,000 feet. And right. we've been able to pattern it's like that's very consistent when we, especially during the summer, four to six right. thousand. So yep, it is possible to pattern these guys, and you know it's interesting that Steve is uh, doing this stuff now where he's t taking all these uh, reports from people and passing them along and reading them and everything. Um, although you should like pre-read some of them. Um, I well, think it's know, great that one, he's doing can it. Just, can I just make a comment about him though? Yeah. I had a good conversation with him off the air. I was his first ever interview that he did. Nice. And um, the one thing, and it, it took me, dude, it took me a lot of convincing to get him on because he was still quite unsure about even putting the own the the reports on his own channel. Yeah. At that point. Whoops. And you know, since then, he's now working very closely with people like David Politis and the Missing Four One One. And, you know, when I was talking to Steve about this, he's like, Dave, I've got so much evidence. He goes, you know, the biggest problem that I, because he's an experiencer. A lot of people don't understand that he's an actual experiencer of this creature where yep. it scared him and his grandfather while they were out hunting. Yeah. And, you know, so he doesn't have any love lost for this creature. But the one thing that I will say is, you know, he's like, Dave, for so many years, a lot of these people who have filed reports, have been laughed at and ridiculed. He goes, I was one of them. Yep. And he goes, what is wrong with believing these stories? You know, people are experiencing something, and the only thing that they want is someone to take charge, whether it's Duke or whether it's Steve or whether it's Dave, David Politis or Dave Scott. They want someone to kindly look at them or read them and say, I believe you. They want someone to take that trail cam picture that it all of a sudden has a bunch of white lights in it, like orbs floating around, and they want to say, see, I told you, this was in the middle of nowhere. I could give you the GPS coordinates to it. And someone to say, I believe you. And that's why, you know, a lot of people rip into him. They're like, oh, his stories are bullshit. They're, they're trying to, they're trying to uh, you know, he just reads anything. This guy buys everything. No, it's about the fact that he actually, in my opinion, cares about people and he just wants people to know that there are people out there who will say, I believe you, because that's one of the sentences we have forgotten in this entire genre. Not that I'm trying to preach here, please don't take me for that, but that's one of the sentences, I believe you, that we've forgotten about, whether it's about ghosts or fairies or Dog man, Bigfoot, UFOs, aliens, greys, cryptids, whatever. It's okay to allow people to share their stories. And because his platform has grown heavily on that, that's where it gets a little intriguing. Consider this, if, as you say, the uh, facts that Bigfoot exists, Sasquatch exists, came out, they would, you know, shut down all the... Uh, big mountainous areas and forests and everything that Bigfoot was in. Um, what's Steve Istall's uh, motivation to, to bring this forward? Because he's essentially cutting his own throat. If they actually went ahead and did that, he wouldn't be able to you know, like guide any hunting tours or anything. That area would all be off limits. So what's his motivation to come forward and do this other than just because it's true? I think it was time for him. You know, there. You know, uh, I'll use a different example. I had one of my listeners... I'm going to keep her name silent right now because you personally would know who she is from our YouTube chat. But I had a listener reach out to me the other day and say, Dave, I have had a lot of experiences that I've kept private for a long time. She goes, I have photographs. I have, I have uh, markings of my body that I photographed. I've got videos of UFOs, daytime, nighttime. She goes, what do I do? I feel, she's like, she's very spiritual. And she's like, my guides are telling me it's time to come public. And I basically said, stop right there. Figure out what you want to do first. 
and realize that the minute you say I'm coming out public in this field, that you are going to be absolutely torn a new one. And you have to make sure that you have a very strong backbone in order to take a lot of the heat because for no reason, there's going to be a lot of people hating you. Yeah. And I think for Steve Istall, the fact that he just doesn't give a flying hoot about anybody outside of what he is doing, because he's he's had a very successful life up until this point, he's just wanting to bring the stories forward. Yes, he wants to prove the creature is real, but I think now that he has had more of an open look at the evidence people have sent him, whether it's photos or videos or trail cam photos or whatever it may be, I think that he wants to literally see what this creature is all about. And personally, even though he hasn't admitted it yet, I think he is starting to come around to the idea that there is something supernatural about it that we need to figure out what it is. And I think that's the reason that he's doing what he's doing because I do know outside of David Politis, even though I don't know the names, I do know that there are a lot of people in the, in the big name communities that are very interested in dealing with them. And the other thing too that I like about Steve, he's not afraid to call people phonies. He's not afraid to call out, you know, people, you know, like the controversial Todd Standing. He's not afraid to call out the BFRO for playing games, you know, like bringing a drum kit into the forest, you know, where it, we could go on for hours about giving examples about that. Yeah. So, you know, I'm going to make people. Well, I'm on the same page as Steve on that one. I've been ripping on the BFRO like since before Never Finding Bigfoot was a TV show because I have lots of friends personally that have been in the BFRO and are 100% convinced they're running an agenda. They alter their reports to- they, uh, Yes, they do. Yep. So I actually had someone reach out to me who filed a report with the BFRO who was absolutely angry with the fact that their story was edited. And he, I'm not gonna name the researcher because everybody would know and I, you know, but I mean, that's for other people to find out or if that person watching this wants to say, hey, that's me, go right ahead. Yeah. All right. But the researcher who, who I talked to about this, who passed me this person's email, and this person and I uh, exchanged a couple of emails, this person had a supernatural experience with the encounter. And when, when he saw the report on the BFRO website, this, the person who filed the report went to the investigator and said, you edited the story. You didn't tell the whole story. And that investigator went and looked at the report and said, my God, what did you do? Called up Matt Moneymaker. And Matt Moneymaker basically said, we don't cover that kind of crap here. You know, that makes us look stupid. Mm -hmm. We're science. Remember the whole science conversation we had yeah. 45 minutes ago? Yeah. Yeah. We're yeah. science. We yeah. don't get into that. Really, Matt, you're playing a freaking drum set on TV in the forest. <laughs> right? Like, come on. Come Whoop, on. Whooping and hollering that stupid? and tree knocking. Yeah, like Bigfoot doesn't know what you're up to and that you're humans doing it. Right. Call blasting, too. They can't tell it's that same pre-recorded call over and over again. and There's no variation like an actual live being would have. Sure. Yeah, it's easy to it's easy to trick Bigfoot. That's why you guys got so many great pictures and video of them over the ten years, huh? Because you're so good at it and your your methods work so well. You know what the definition of insanity is? Trying the same failed methodology over and over again, thinking you're going to get a different result. I love it. I love it. I love it. <laughs> Sorry, cold facts, man. I don't sugarcoat it. Uh, the only one on that team that knows anything at all is Bobo, and I feel sorry that he fell in with them. You know, he used to be out with Autumn Williams and other people doing research before there was a Finding Bigfoot. And he does know a lot about Bigfoot, so I have some respect for him. Uh, the rest of them, no. Did, did we, in the last interview, and I, I was just thinking about this, the last interview that we did, did we did we talk about my hatred for the word Squatch? <laughs> Probably, yeah. And guess where that came from? Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. My goal before I die or leave this entire field is to make everybody hate the word squatch. Let's just eliminate it from our vocabularies, people. All right? Eliminate it. Yeah, call them the local, uh, the local natives always have a name for your local uh, 
Bigfoot Sasquatch, and that's what you should call them. Because sometimes that's what they call themselves, and the natives were in communication with them, and they knew that, and that's why they have that name. Like down in Louisiana, in that area, the tribes down there call them Sulkulu. Well, that's what they call themselves. <laughs> so that's not derogatory. On the other hand, it seems like they don't like the word Bigfoot. So if you don't want to piss off the Bigfoot when you're out in the woods, don't call them Bigfoot. <laughs> well, Or they might call you Tiny Wiener in retaliation, so don't do it. Oh, man. You're so right. You're so right. <laughs> well, anyway, Dave, it's been a hoot. Glad to have had you back again. I think we're at, what, an hour and a half now almost? I've been at it for a while here. Whatever. It's been a blast. Yeah, and don't forget, you're always welcome to come back again. I'm sure after they see this show, they'll once again be pastoring me going, you got to have Dave on again so you guys can ram ramble endlessly about aliens and government suppression and Bigfoot and all that kind of stuff. <laughs> well, you know what? I, I want to say thank you, man. Uh, you know, uh, I've only really started concentrating on the YouTube thing a little while ago, uh, about a year and a half ago is when I really started taking it a little bit more serious than... I had been because, you know, having this face for radio in my world, it doesn't pan out very well on, on television, you know, minus the hair because don't want the hair. Or <laughs> no, the, the hair is great. The hair is great. But, but I got to tell you, man, I, you know, watching what you do and, and your followers who have graciously checked out Spaced Out Radio and, and now have subscribed to my channel, I probably owe probably you – I owe you a few beers because I probably made about – you know, 350, 400 subscribers just off of you, you know, and, and coming on my show as a guest and now, you know, returning the favor. So I guess beer's on me for helping uh, grow our channel a little bit if we ever get together for one. And I, hopefully once this COVID crap is over, we can, we can do that and, uh, you know, have a beer in the middle of the forest and go uh, watch some, for some Sasquatch. In, indeedy doodly. Let's go find the Sasquatch. But, um, you know, I, that's part of my goal, man. I want to try and get more of these people that have platforms that are reasonable, have their heads screwed on straight, to actually interact and work with each other. We could move things forward so much more quickly if everybody would quit being a hermit isolationist and uh, would actually, like, work with other people. And that's basically my goal. I just want people to realize that, hey, we should all, you know, this is a community. Bigfoot community has never been a community. Let's make it a community. The guys that don't want to agree with us, just ignore them. We'll just work together until they figure it out, and then they'll join too. <laughs> well, just one more thing I'd like to say for people out there who are, are looking at this, and call me a jerk or whatever. I, I really don't care. You know, number one, know what you're looking for. Number two, don't hide behind the word science when you haven't conducted anything scientific. Yep. And number three, if you see me out in the field and I'm being ripped apart by a Bigfoot, let it go. Just let it happen because that's a good death. I'd say number three, if you see him being ripped apart by a Sasquatch and you can't intervene, film it at least. Exactly. <laughs> You're way too much fun, man. Thank you. Uh, I actually said that uh, we, were, we were at the ghost town of Coloma, and uh, they were all doing the investigation. This one heavily haunted shack. This place is just terrifying, even during the day. And uh, one of them with his thermal was looking out the door and saw a big something moving along the ridge line. And I went, okay, I'll walk up there and check it out. So I took the flashlight, and I walked up there by myself while they were all investigating this ghost house. And then I came back again. They said, you see anything? And I said, well, I had a feeling that there was one of them behind these three big standing stones off to my left. But there wasn't anybody there to film when he swatted me 30 feet through the air, so I decided not to go around and check. <laughs> but when I got up there, he was hiding, so that was good enough. I came back again. <laughs> you imagine the power of being swatted 30 feet? Yeah, and uh, those big boys swat you 30 feet, so that's why oh, I yeah. make sure that it's on video when I get swatted 30 feet, because I probably won't survive it. <laughs> exactly. I want that to happen, Duke. I want that to happen. <laughs> If I'm going to get swatted by Bigfoot, at least get video of it. That's all I ask. <laughs> Is that too much to ask? Let's no. Go. Jeez, it's like some people would complain if you hung them with a brand new gold-plated rope, I tell you. But <laughs> anyway, Dave, once again, wonderful to have you on the show. And I will be, of course, visiting your show. And I encourage everybody else to do the same. Dave always has really great guests. 
does a great job of picking their brains. He has long format, so they get to be on for more than an hour. They get more time to explain what's going on and tell you really cool stories. So go over and check it out, Spaced Out Radio. And uh, to everybody else out there, make sure that whatever you do, don't hug the Wookiee.